welcome. So let's play Rule the Ways 2 as France, starting in 1920. This is episode 97. The game is over. Let the analysis begin. There's going to be at least two, possibly three analysis videos because I've got a lot to talk about from what I've learned from playing this game. And hopefully you'll be dropping a lot of comments in about some of the things you've observed as you've followed this game series. I'm going to start this video with the overall game parameters with which I played, uh, just as a refresher, because those parameters can determine a lot about the course of the game. Then I'm going to go and explore the end of game reports that the game itself uh, provides. Um, after that, I'm going to look at uh, deploying your fleet for war. You know, what do you do when war is in your own sea zone? Probably simple enough. What do you do when it's a, in a distant sea zone? What do you do if it's in a distant sea zone and you don't have enough basing for a fleet? And what do you do when you do have enough basing for a fleet? Three very different styles of going to war. Let's have a little look. And here are the parameters by which I played the game now. Uh, I set the size to larger, and it could have been bigger still or super big, but I didn't want the Navy to be an administrative burden with so many ships to look after. Equally, I didn't want it to be too few, so this seemed like a nice Goldilocks kind of size. I used the Treaty of Versailles, primarily stuffing the Germans and <laughs> making them start from an abysmal beginning. I used, as I always do, varied tech. Uh, I argue that we kind of know too much about what's going on around the technology, and having varied tech makes it a little less predictable going forward. I used random arms treaties. The arms treaties in the game are kind of pretty weak. You know, it only takes a war to stop them coming into a force, and you can expect a war to come along every five years or something. So rather than, again, having the predictable Washington Naval Treaty restrictions, I thought it'd be interesting to have a random one, but as it played out, it didn't really matter. I did use the limited dockyards throughout, so I didn't build up my dockyards to be able to build the biggest and best battleships and battle cruisers. I merely made it so they could build fleet carriers and everything below that, and used my friends overseas to waste their money building big docks and building my battleships with them. Now there comes a risk with that, which is that if tensions increase past, I think it is six, with someone you're building a battleship with, it risks them confiscating the battleship and you losing a massive amount of investment. That never happened. I had some excellent allies. Um, and so that saved me quite a bit of money, certainly enough to buy a heavy cruiser possibly a bit more research usually i kept it at max i know it says that you know 11 and 12 percent are diminishing returns and probably 10 percent is optimal but it's just too enticing to just try and grasp for that extra thing um i used in most areas the priority to be set to low and then just had a few in medium and one or two in high i find that's a better directed priority than um, trying to have everything at high. Obviously, it's a relative scale. If you have everything at low, it actually has all the same priority going across. Doctrines. I used elite pilot training because I felt that as the carriers became the dominant weapon in the game, having the very best pilots would achieve the greatest number of hits and bring us victory. Plain and simple. Look, search priority just to stop uh, carrier-borne uh, planes having to um, go off and waste their efforts doing search. Oxygen fuel torpedoes, I'm not absolutely sure how much effect that had, but I had it there. Uh, driving shells, I think that might be diving shells, uh, armor-piercing only. I didn't do any gunnery or night fighting or torpedo warfare doctrines. And I didn't do that because I think that those are early period doctrines. I think they're 1900 to 1920. I think they're very, very powerful. Um, but 
gunnery doctrine kind of reduces his impact as fire control gets better and better. Night fighting loses its impact as radar comes along. And ditto, I guess, torpedo warfare. So back in 1900, when all of these things are abysmal, I think these things carry a lot of weight. By 1930, certainly, I don't think they do. And then finally, changes to ammunition usage and loadout. This is a personal failing of mine. I always forget to do this. I've read on the forums one or two examples of why you might and how you might do it, but I never do. Tell me where I'm going wrong uh, and how I could have uh, arranged things better. Victory, the, as I've uh, called it, felt victorious. The game's analysis of these uh, 35 years was surmised in four tables. It's important if you want to reflect on these tables that you screen capture them because seemingly they're not accessible after you've saved the game and come out of it and, and ended it. So that's what I've done. And even though I have big screens, I had to screen capture them in two bits because they are too too wide to show uh, in uh, in one effort. So here we have a record of the wars I fought, the battles I fought within those wars, and the prestige. Now, I wasn't playing for prestige. If I had prestige, which is this red line, would have gone much higher. Uh, I achieved something like 50. It probably would have been double that if I'd been explicitly being concerned about prestige, but I didn't. The wars are expressed in green for victory, grey for what the game considers um, a draw, and red for defeats. And as you can see, there are no uh, defeats. Eight wars against Italy, against the Soviet Union, against America, against Italy again, against Britain, against Italy for a third time, against Japan, and against the Soviet Union. So a good spread of opponents. The only one missing, notably, is Germany. The wars themselves, each would generally have uh, major battles. It gives two of the battles to Britain, the Battle of the Western, sorry, one to Britain and one to Italy, the Battle of Malta here and the Battle of Western Approaches. Um, I would probably have called them draws. Um, likewise, the war with America certainly was a draw mainly because the Americans just wouldn't come out and fight. The war against Britain was a draw, but kind of a French victory because the British fleet was substantially more powerful than the French fleet. So being able to come out uh, without significant losses and with four out of the five battles victorious, I thought was um, a good result. Calling the Japanese war a draw, I think, is a little bit of a cheek. The, um, the Japanese called for peace, and I sort of went middling on peace, and it, and it snatched it and said, yes, we'll have that. I had caused them two big losses. Um, it was only really because it was in the late game, and I was thinking, mm, do I want this war to, to drag out? Do I want to sneak in another war after this war? that I, I offered it peace. So personally, I regard this as a victory and that's what matters. So that's the, the overall shape. Um, the length, I've just roughly calculated in, in quarters of a year. So one for the Italians, three for the Soviet Union, eight for America, two again for Italy the second time, five for Britain, six quarters for Italy the third time, two for Japan and two for the Soviet Union. Now, I have a feeling that short wars are better. If your war goes much beyond two quarters, I tend to think that that is uh, helping all the other countries that aren't at war greatly because they get war increases in their budgets, even though they're not at war and they're not having to pay for war maintenance of their ships, and they're not having to suffer any losses, and they're not having to suffer any interruption of you know building big ships, which often occurs during the war. So they can just go sailing on, piling on extra strength to their navies. 
the long wars advantage everybody else so try and avoid them obviously my longest war for two years against america um was an exception but that that was such a tricky battle to uh, a tricky war to bring to a conclusion because it was so indecisive next up fleet tonnage um, a confusing little graph uh, here are the flags so america is white germany yellow britain blue japan purple france is red the soviet union is cyan and the italians are pink things to note here are first of all the americans had this big dip around about 1940 from 38 round to 44 i can only assume that was primarily around scrapping a large number of ships um, because it certainly wasn't involved in any war obviously they went off this scale it's an odd scale uh, you get these numbers multiplied by 30,000 tons not sure why that is um the uninterrupted rise of germany is also of note so they started down here with next to nothing and then they just added ships after ships after ships after ships one or uh, two little uh, scrappings towards the end but because they weren't in any war um they did very nicely thank you very very much britain uh, came along and paralleled the united states until you get to about here where it starts to decline now that's partly a relative decline so the americans went down with scrapping i imagine the british went down in scrapping they then paralleled themselves again but the british went down with a bit more scrapping and stayed stable whilst the americans shot up and literally went off the scale What you see with the Italians in pink is constantly being pegged back. So look, there's a dip there in my war. Uh, and then when I come to here, they managed to get away with that pretty well. They have some mass scrappings. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at um, myself. So they dip down here. They dip down a second time on their second wall they then come along and there's this absolutely catastrophic uh loss of tonnage through my two absolutely thumping victories over them they still managed to put a fair bit of tonnage back on in the uh, the few years remaining likewise the soviet union in cyan also starts at a low point also had a dip down with the war with me so you can pretty much halved its tonnage so you can really see the impact of these wars can have nonetheless it uh, merely added tonnage pretty quickly and carried on getting quite a respectable amount of tonnage until at the end it was comparable to france and then boom it's halved again in its war with uh, with me and even the uh, Japanese, where they award this to a draw, you can see in the war, there's this fair chunk of a dip caused by uh, my success. Uh, so yeah, interesting. You can see also the impact of my scrapping. So had I not been so scrap happy, slash had I not been so tight on the budget, um, then here, here after this war this big one after this war again another big one here and a final one just at the end of the game this would have all had led france to be comparable probably to germany in terms of tonnage but i would have struggled with an aging fleet with not the best weapons next up we have the economics and here you could just basically see a gradual rise for everybody except for the USA that goes off the scale. Now, this isn't how much money you get. This is the base economy, how much wealth the country has in which the budget fluctuates up and down according to the increase in tensions and decrease in tensions and whether you're at war and whether you're at peace. Um, 
Notice that if I go back, the Germans are number two in their uh, tonnage. But if I come here, they're actually one, two, three, four, number five in terms of their economic potential. So I can only imagine that they were really struggling to actually be able to afford the really big and old fleet that they were maintaining. And here, by the way, are just the growth rates, um, roughly calculated. So plus 60% for the USA from where it started in 1920 to where it ended up in 1957. 38% uh, for Japan, very respectable. 30 and 27 for Britain and France. And then down at the bottom, 23, 22s for Russia, Italy, and Germany. So you can see Germany had a low growth rate yet it came out with the second biggest navy because there was no war and that really is something to take into consideration when you're trying to pick an opponent now i know the game can be very irritating in terms of you know deciding no we're not going to have a war with germany i would have loved a, a war with germany instead of three with italy uh, two with italy was perfectly enough thank you very much but that wasn't to happen the losses of ships so here are all the ships lost over this period. It's a little hard to read, so I've just summarized it like this. So battleships, we lost four, the Russians lost four, the British lost two, and the Italians lost 11. Carriers, we lost two, Russia six, Britain one, Italy 11 again, and Japan three. Now, bear in mind, France faced eight wars, Italy faced three, um, and everybody else faced one or two, except for Germany, who didn't have any. Although for some mysterious reason, they still managed to lose a destroyer somehow. I don't know how. Um, because France fought so many wars, we lost an awful lot of destroyers and corvettes and a huge number of submarines, even though I didn't really major on submarines. I never really, I'm a bit suspicious of submarines as a campaign. It's also a bit dull. And unless it's a very specific tactic, like you know you want to go to war with Britain and you build an absolutely vast amount of coastal submarines to blockade Britain, um, aside from that, it's just not too useful. Uh, I certainly didn't get my money's worth out of all these submarines lost. So uh, that's quite interesting. Again, Russia, 19 cruisers, uh, Italy, 21 against France's 11. So pretty good, pretty good. I think if you divide French losses by eight, you get to uh, quite an interesting figure. Something I think a record to be proud of. Technology. Um, this strange picture amuses me greatly. Uh, I've been experimenting as many people have with the chat GTP and similar AI products. And in one that does text to a picture where you can just write out a word and it will generate a picture from it. I wrote the words torpedo bomber. This is what it came up with, a slightly literal interpretation of a torpedo in some mad plane type configuration over the sea. And I thought I'd keep it because it's kind of indicative of you don't know where technology is going in the future and we suffer from knowing too much. Um, even with varied technology, that kind of just helps around the margins. Here are the at start, the 1900 at start research categories. Um, here are all the categories. Here are the number of advances that you get per category. This is when you get the first of the research advances. And here is when you get to the end of them. I suppose technically it's when the last one becomes available. You might not get it till later. And then here in summary is what's happening under each of these. 
So for machinery, you're primarily getting weight savings. For armor, you're primarily getting armor improvements. For hull, you're going back to getting weight savings. For fire control, primarily accuracy and a few enablers. Enables are things that have been invented in fire control. Of course, these are all the different fire control systems. Damage control, you get improved damage control and obviously improved torpedo protection. Gun mountings, mainly rate of fire and a number of different gunnery configurations that get enabled like dual purpose five inch guns or having secondary guns larger than seven inch. Ship design I think is one of the really interesting ones because it primarily enables a whole pile of different technologies. In fact let's just uh, bring across my fearsome spreadsheet and have a look but uh, where that is, if I can find it, ship design, here we go. Um, so, you know, heavy secondary batteries, medium wing turrets, centerline turrets, more centerline turrets, um, secondary turrets on BBs, all sorts of bits that substantially improve the quality of the design of your ship. So that I think is something to, um, to bear in mind not all advances are equal some are very focused on one specific thing and some like ship design allow for an awful lot of innovation and invention i'll i'll include this um excel file in the uh, in the comments below um just click on it to access it you you might need me to give you permission i'll always give you permission uh, i'll try and find if i can make it not require permission um, armor piercing projectiles are all about increased penetration light forces like ship design is one of these that enables a great many things and again is one of these standout uh, research area torpedoes primarily range and damage and explosive shells and it's surprisingly mainly about damage so um, that's that of note is that First of all, fire control ends in 1957 rather than 1955. And I didn't get that final one. I only got 26 out of the 27. I also only got 25 out of the 26 light forces, despite the final one being available in 1952. So, and, and that's a common theme. In fact, you'll see it worse in this. So this second list are all the later technologies that become available the later game if you like and again i didn't get all of the submarines and i was four behind anti-aircraft despite having anti-aircraft artillery as a high priority and moaning about it repeatedly on many episodes so submarines reliability and effectiveness asw primarily about asw capability fleet tactics is a third of these big important areas with uh, hull design and light forces, 10 enablers there, and lots of impacts on all sorts of different things. And the aircraft, effectiveness and enables again, these enables are, you know, different calibers of gun being uh, allowed as anti-aircraft guns and AA directors and all that kind of stuff. Radar, improvements in radar and in enabling different kinds of radar. Airships, good old airships, um, enables different sorts of airships and fighters to be mounted on airships and improvements. Ends in 1926, so, you know, should always be low, really. Um, Fleet Tactics, by the way, ends in 1944, a full 11 years before the end of the game. It's why I think the 1955 game with the exception of the impact of SAMs, is feels a lot like 1945. I imagine that will be very different in Rule the Waves 3. Aeroplanes, all about enabling different kinds of planes and improving their performance and different kinds of um, weapon loads. Aircraft operations, ditto, improves the operation of ships and enables different technologies to uh, make this happen. Again, aeroplanes stop at 1944 um, and aircraft operations at 1950. 
Finally, missiles, which also end at 57, although weirdly, I managed to get all seven of them. Um, and amphibious, which just improves the ability very gradually, and again, ends in 1943. So useful, whilst I don't like knowing exactly what's going to come when, you know, you might want to live on this spreadsheet and go, oh yeah, the next one's going to be la la la, I wouldn't do that, and, you know, I would always forget anyhow. But it does tell you that fleet operations, light forces, and ship design are particularly important because of the breadth of their scope, as well, of course, as some which in a 1920-55 game are just going to be important. You know, air operations and aeroplanes and anti-air are all always going to be important. And if you're going to go up into 1950s, missiles uh, and investing in missiles, as I did with lots of refits to put missiles onto cruisers and destroyers and battleships, that's going to be important too. Next, uh, what I've called war fleet deployments. So this is about how do you organize your navy for the kind of war that's appeared? So if it's a close neighbor, if it's in the same sea zone, well, it should be pretty simple. Um, it is what your fleet's primarily designed for. It will involve pretty much your whole navy, except for the bits and bobs that are out on colonial duty. It will involve your whole land-based air, probably. Um, a battle generator will usually set up roughly even battles, so even if you are against a superior opponent, say Britain in 1920, um, you, it, it won't necessarily be overwhelming, and if it is occasionally, well, it's okay to re retire gracefully. Um, in fact, some of the most exciting battles, uh, like um, in World War II, Admiral Vienne in, in the Second Battle of Sirte, where he was protecting a convoy and he only had um, destroyers and cruisers, I think, maybe even just destroyers, I think there were cruisers there, against the Italian battleship or two and a pile of Italian cruisers, very superior force. He constantly used smoke screens, which is another thing I always forget to use, by the way, and the threat of torpedo attack to constantly make the Italians cautious whilst the convoy uh, managed to escape. Now, we don't have control over convoy directions, which is sad because it would be great to tell the convoy to go in another direction away from the enemy. Hopefully that might be a thing in Rule the Ways 3, but it's okay to kind of win through a draw against a greatly superior enemy. But, you know, really, you should crush your opponent here, no pressure. Um, and a fighting draw, in my mind, is still a victory. So that all should be perfectly sweet and straightforward. If you are fighting a distant war, then it really depends, do you have basing or do you not? So my war with Japan was very distant. It was three sea zones away from the Med, four from Northern Europe, but Southeast Asia did have enough basing to put together a substantial fleet. And I organized my fleet to fill up that basing. And then behind it, in the Indian Ocean, I had a reserve fleet of some spare ships to backfill my uh, main fleet in case there were any losses or any... Um, attrition, although that shouldn't be, and any ships that had to go into dock for repairs. So constantly kind of putting stuff from the Indian Ocean that the South Pacific would have worked to into the uh, Southeast Asia and then back out again, trying to keep my Southeast Asian fleet at the maximum capacity, not over, not under, but a fullest fleet that I could manage. Equally, deploying the maximum air. So I built bases in Northern Europe and Mediterranean and Southeast Asia that were approximately equal. And I had one air force, not three air forces, which saved a huge amount of money. That's some mistake I did in earlier games. So I just moved the entire air force from Northern Europe to Southeast Asia relatively easily um, without having to have the cost 
It does mean that in Europe and the Mediterranean there were nearly no air, air units at all, but Japan was so far away that that didn't really matter. If you have time and foresight, uh, do make sure that your air bases are sufficient to take your air force and do build coastal defenses and i think motor torpedo boat squadrons i think they also make invasions difficulty difficult um the more coastal defenses you have the harder it is for an enemy to invade and that you know can be a huge um thing particularly i think japan caught me on the hop slightly and so it took several turns for my fleet to arrive in southeast asia and they did mount one invasion but the defenses were strong enough not to be overwhelmed too quickly so i had time to arrive and successfully fight several battles which defeated the invasion how dare they call it a draw that's one style of fighting a distant war. The other style is if you don't have basing. So in my war with America, I had one tiny possession in the Caribbean and that was never going to be able to do anything in particular. And so there are two ways of doing this. The offensive way is to organize two fleets and kind of rotate them into the distant water. So I created uh, my force to raid um taking a name from the french squadron of the 1939 1940 that used to try and hunt down uh german uh, raiders and send them across to northeast america and then when that began to attrit when you got those annoying uh asterisks against the crew quality and crew quality started to decline i'd have to pull it back and you kind of got two options. The one I did was I pulled it back, I waited for it to recover, get rid of its attrition, and then I would send it forward again. Or I could have sent my slow fleet over to America. Now, I didn't do that because I felt the slow fleet, you know, the battleships with 21 knots rather than the fast battleships at 28, would be at a tactical disadvantage if they came against Americans who were substantially faster. Um, meaning you'd struggle to retire if you met superior forces and you would struggle to chase if they declined the engagement, leading to a lot of stalemates and risking losses. However, rotating a fast and a slow fleet, or if you're later in the game and it's all fast, rotating two fast fleets, um, I think is a, is a very viable option. Um, it didn't really work with the Americans, but it's because they sent their fleet to the Caribbean uh, and never came back and never came to attack me. If you do this, you need to split your CVs and have a CV in both um, because you're not going to get any support from land-based air. Um, I would certainly suggest that if you don't have strong enough CVs, then you put them all into one, your best force, and just send that backwards and forwards and leave the slow fleet back in home waters where it can be supported by land-based air. Um, if you're going to have this kind of war, then obviously medium and mine layer submarines are probably your friend. Uh, I have had very poor record with mine layer submarines they seem to be lost in huge numbers and i stopped building them let me know if you have a different experience um you have to accept that weak colonies that are isolated are just going to be invaded and you're going to lose them it's, that's just how it's going to be and equally you're not going to be in able to invade any of their colonies so victory is going to come either by battle loss you know you're going to defeat them at sea or by blockade and unrest and war weariness although you may sub be subject to war weariness as well in a long war and my war with america was was two years long the alternative to this offensive no basing strategy is just make them come to you just put the onus on them to go into two sea zones away and see what they come up with um this avoids any hostages by sending them off to 
your enemy's coastal waters uh, and allows you to sit there with your mass maximum strength. Yes, you're going to lose your colonies, but you're going to lose your colonies anyway. Um, it's true, America could have, you know, nipped over to West Africa or something like that, but I don't think it could have done any invasions. So it could have attacked some of my uh, colonial ships on station. But aside from that, um, making them come to you, I think, is a very viable, uh, if passive, uh, strategy. So that's, that's how you do a distant war. Next, I was going to cover fleet design, but I see I've already gone on long enough for this. So I will start that in the next video. Something to, uh, to whet your appetite for. Thanks for watching this. I hope you've enjoyed it. If it's provoked any thoughts, please share them in the comments. I'd love to be able to uh, respond to them. And on a personal note, uh, thank you for all the kind wishes to my previous video. Uh, it really meant a lot, actually, a lot of sharing and a lot of interesting uh, comments. You you never quite know the impact of what you give out when you do something like this. So it was uh, really, very touching. Thank you.